Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 257 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. What was it like to live as a woman of faith in the early American Republic? What was it like to live as a Catholic in the early United States? Catherine O'Donnell, an associate professor of history at Arizona State University, is going to help us investigate some answers to these questions by taking us through the life of the United States' first saint, Elizabeth Ann Seton. Now, using details from her book, Elizabeth Seton, A Life, Catherine reveals details about Elizabeth Seton's life and accomplishments information about Seton's search for faith and her decision to convert to Catholicism, and what Elizabeth Seton's life can show us about what it was like to live as a Catholic and a life of faith in the early United States. But first, hello, Atlanta. I'm coming out to your fine city to speak at a conference in October, and I'd love to host a meetup while I'm in town. So we'll meet up on Saturday, October 12 at 4 p.m. at the Atkins Park Restaurant on North Highland Avenue. Now, If you're interested in this meetup because you happen to live in Atlanta, or like me, you'll be visiting this great city, I've listed all the details you need to attend the meetup at benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. And Bill, Lindy, and Jenny, thank you for reaching out and for helping me find a place for us to meet. Your suggestions were really helpful, and I know this meetup is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you. All right. Are you ready to investigate Elizabeth Seton's life? Find out what it was like to live as a Catholic in the early years of the United States. Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is an associate professor of history at Arizona State University. Her research interests are in early American cultural and religious history. She's published numerous articles and book chapters and two books, including Men of Letters in the Early Republic, Cultivating Citizenship, and most recently, Elizabeth Seton, A Life. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Catherine O'Donnell. Thank you so much. So, Catherine, you've written a biography about Elizabeth Seton, who was this early American woman who seemed to live through many major events in the history of the early United States and who was canonized a saint by the Catholic Church in 1975. Now, I think we're in for a really interesting conversation about Seton and her life, and I wonder if we could begin that conversation with a brief overview of who Elizabeth Seton was and about the different events that she lived through and witnessed. Of course. Elizabeth Seton was born in 1774, so as the revolution approached, she was born in Manhattan, and she died in 1821 in rural Maryland. And during that time, she converted from Protestantism to Catholicism and ended up founding the first order in the United States of Catholic women religious, the Sisters of Charity, to found schools and orphanages, and which still exists. And during her life, she really did see and experience a lot. So she lost her mother when she was three during the revolution. She watched her father, who had been a loyalist, struggle to reestablish himself as the city kind of came back to life during the early national period. She was fascinated by the kind of philosophy that elite New Yorkers were reading, Voltaire, Rousseau. She married a transatlantic merchant and hobnobbed with some fairly prominent New Yorkers, lived on Wall Street between Hamilton and Burr, in fact. She lived through the yellow fever epidemics, which her father tried to control, watched her husband go bankrupt and become one of the early people to use the Bankruptcy Act of 1800. And then, as I say, she moved to Maryland with her children, saw a very different community with prominent Catholics, and then finally went to what really was in a meaningful way a frontier and established a religious community there. So it was an unexpected and really dramatic life. Yeah, it sounds like there was a lot in Seton's life that was quite ordinary. Death, money problems, political disagreements, illnesses. And at the same time, there was a lot that was extraordinary about her life. Like she hobnobbed with Hamilton and Burr and witnessed all these events that we've come to know that are really important in the history of the early United States. 
Yeah, I think we're all combinations of the ordinary and the extraordinary, and she is as well. So right, the threat of illness, the precarity even of a privileged position as a ship sank and fortunes were lost, her exposure to the different forms of religion that were taking root in New York. So Quakerism, Evangelicalism, Catholicism, Anglicanism. She saw things and experienced things that a lot of other people did as well. And yet she also had access to archbishops and fairly powerful merchants in Italy. And she possessed also a level of ambition that was distinctive. Now, historians of early America often report that they find it really difficult to uncover historical sources that can reveal details about women's lives. But in the introduction to Catherine's book, Elizabeth Seton, A Life, Catherine notes that Seton's followers created an extraordinarily rich archive of materials about Seton's life. So, Catherine, would you tell us about the archive you found for Seton and about the different types of information that those records contain about her life? I would love to. It is a treasure trove because sainthood is it's a lot of things, right? It's also a process of memory making the kind of powerful institution behind it. So archives that Sisters of Charity have kept, as well as secular archives, such as the New York Historical Society and the Maryland Historical Society, have letters, journals, letters to Elizabeth, everything from kind of fairly extensive philosophical reflections to these little tiny notes that were made small so that they could be hidden which she and female relatives wrote when she was encouraging them secretly to consider Catholicism. And there's also things that kind of might look dull, but of course aren't like receipts from when she's founding her religious community. So you can see that as she's kind of developing a spiritual ethos, she's also, you know, buying fuel and she's also charging children because they rip their pantaloons as soon as they're bought. So that kind of documentation also sort of fills out the picture of her life in a way that is just extraordinary. You mentioned that part of sainthood is memory making. And when we make memories, we really tend to be selective, right? I mean, our memories tend to either embellish the really positive or the really negative where the truth is somewhere in between. And I wonder whether as a historian, you had to apply any techniques or extra methodologies or perhaps an extra bit of skepticism to read the Seton archives so that you could really suss out the most accurate information about her life. Absolutely. There were moments when I thought to myself, Catherine, (laughs) when exactly did you decide to write an historical biography of a saint? You know, it's sort of mixing two forms of commemoration there. But the same techniques apply. There is this rich source body, and there are also likely gaps in the record. For example, she had a very close friend, Julia Scott, and the letters that survive are quite revealing, but there aren't nearly as many of them as there should be. So my sense is Elizabeth herself probably got rid of some of those. And in fact, it is Elizabeth who proved the most eager to destroy the record of her life. She actually was going to burn all of her papers, all of this treasure trove that I'm describing late in her life. And it's exactly because she knew perfectly well that people turned to her as an exemplar of the Catholic Church. Catholicism was a mistrusted religion. And she knew that she'd had a journey through all kinds of beliefs. She had gotten angry at people. She'd been snarky, right? All of this is in the papers. And she really wanted to clean that trail away so that all that would be left was Mother Seton. And in fact, it was a priest, a collaborator, who encouraged her not to burn them and said that the whole record of your life will be useful. Now, that's a faith-based approach, right? But it preserved an archive that I, as a scholar, could use. We tend to hear a lot about Martha Washington and Eliza Hamilton and how they destroyed the bulk of their papers because they really didn't want anyone to have a good glimpse into their private lives. And it sounds like Seton felt largely the same way. And like she didn't want future people to see that at times she was really just a human. 
Yeah, she was human. She had been very interested in French philosophy. And of course, no one now is shocked that one is reading Rousseau. But by the 18 teens and 20s, a lot of Americans, by no means just Catholics, had rejected that kind of post-revolutionary moment of inquiry as dangerous, deistic, right? And so she was worried about that. She had done quiet battle with a number of priests <laughs> throughout her life, as is a common story among female saints. And I think that she was not eager for that to be visible. So as you noted before, people are ordinary and extraordinary. And so her impulse to hide, to clean up after herself is one that we see in other people, certainly in other women. And it also had kind of distinctive links to what she realized would be her prominent position within this somewhat suspect at the time faith of Catholicism. Do we know why Seton's records were saved and why she didn't destroy them if her preference would have been to destroy them? Was it because of her faith? So a priest with whom she collaborated very closely encouraged her not to destroy them. And he also thought that her early life was the picture of error <laughs> in a way that we would not. But his view was that the whole journey would be illuminating and basically that she had nothing to be ashamed of. There were also already family members, friends in Italy who had preserved things during her lifetime, a journal she'd written during a very traumatic period when her husband was dying, had already been copied by a number of people and sent around because it was so moving. So both because of this priest's intervention and because people had already begun to preserve things, her papers survived and she stood down from that initial impulse to burn. Okay, so why don't we start digging into the details that this rich historical record reveals about Seton's life? Catherine, what does the historical record reveal about Elizabeth Bailey Seton's early life and her childhood? She was born to a very ambitious doctor, someone who wanted to find out the causes of disease, and someone who actually served briefly in the British Army as a medical officer during the war. After the war, during her childhood, her father was becoming a crusading physician who was trying to figure out the cause of, in particular, yellow fever epidemics, but also of the various diseases that roiled New York, as they did other cities, not least port cities. And the record also shows that she was not particularly interested in institutional Christianity. Her father did not attend church that often. She did have spiritual longings, I think one could say, but institutional Christianity did not really suit her purposes. And she was a melancholic teenager. She worried that she felt things too deeply. And at one point, and she records this and then goes back later to it in her life, she seems to have looked at a vial of opium that her father as a physician would have had and considered taking her own life because she just found her emotions too painful. She did not do that. She was grateful for not doing that. But it was this sort of turbulent adolescence, complete with a stepmother who really had a difficult time nurturing her stepdaughters. And now to fast forward a bit, by the age of 30, Seton, who as a child had not found organized Christianity to make a whole lot of sense for her, 30-year-old Seton made the decision to convert to Catholicism. So, Catherine, I'm curious as to where and when Seton's interest in religion and Catholicism developed, because it really does sound like as a teen and young adult, she just wasn't all that interested in organized Christianity. She had a kind of desire to feel God's presence, I think is how she would put it. And she would often go out into nature and fall to her knees in a natural setting. She was interested in the Quakers. She liked the Methodist hymns that she heard being sung on the streets of Manhattan. But it was not until she was a mother of young children and her young, handsome husband began to cough and run fevers and show signs of tuberculosis that she became more interested in Episcopalianism which was a religion she knew through Trinity Church and its young, somewhat controversial minister, a guy named John Henry Hobart. 
So she did become interested in Christianity during that difficult period. But she and her husband made this desperate decision to travel to Italy as not only his health, but his business failed. They were going to stay with a merchant family, the Felici, who were friends and business partners. But William's health declined dramatically on their arrival, in part because they were quarantined in what was basically a lighthouse, an uninsulated stone building. And he died within about a month of their arrival. So you have to picture this young widow, Elizabeth, who is there also with her eight-year-old daughter, stunned by her father's death, in the household of a merchant family who is determined to convert this clearly pious but Protestant and prominent American woman. They see her as someone who can bring Catholicism to the United States in a way they've long been interested in. And she honestly is at first just amused. She sees the kind of inappropriateness of their efforts with a grieving widow, doesn't blame them for it, but doesn't take it seriously either. But they have the wit to take her to Florence. And she sees these gorgeous Italian churches and religious art. She is interested in nuns that she sees. She slowly comes to feel that people in Italian churches are actually paying attention and being faithful in a way that she felt New Yorkers had not been. Some of this is a tourist sensibility, right? There's a little eat, pray, love kind of thing going on here. But she's also very moved by the way Catholicism seems to connect heaven and earth through the culture of the saints, through the religious imagery, through even gestures like making the sign of the cross, which she had never seen before. She feels connected to the divine in a way that she had not in her Protestant life. And I think, honestly, she's also weary of choice. New York had all kinds of possibilities. Everything could be dabbled in. She tried out various ways of thinking and feeling. And what she thought she saw in Italian Catholicism was a kind of all-encompassing way of worshiping and being in the world. And she found it beautiful and restful, and she wanted to be a part of it. Yeah, wow. It really sounds like Seton was taken with the ascetics of Catholicism as much as she was taken by the faith. Unquestionably, she was. And she writes at one point that Protestants disapprove of this as kind of cheating, essentially. And she said, well, Catholics understand how the human heart works. These kind of objects and paintings and the saints as figures that one could admire connect individuals to God in a way that she felt a more abstract Protestantism did not. Now, you said that the Felici brothers really thought that Seton could bring Catholicism to the United States and that the United States would make a good home for Catholicism. And it's that idea that the United States would be a good home for Catholicism that really seems to run contrary to a lot of perceptions about the early United States, which is that many perceptions of the early United States is that it was a hostile place for Catholicism. So, Catherine, what's the real story here? How did early Americans view Catholicism? There absolutely was a rich tradition of anti-Catholicism or anti-popery, as they would have said then. So like the English, many Protestant Americans felt that Catholics could not think for themselves, that they were loyal to the Pope rather than to the nation, and basically that they were polytheistic, right? I'm going on about the, the culture of the saints, as a lot of Protestants thought those were all demigods and thus completely inappropriate. So there's real mistrust. There's also a lot of sort of pop culture mockery, right? Burning an effigy of the Pope on Guy Fox Day and so forth. That was prevalent. On the other hand, there was also, and this is particularly the case during and after the revolution, a great deal of daily tolerance. You saw a reduction in kind of the limits placed on what Catholics could do in the states as the revolution progressed. In Elizabeth Seton's circle, most of them were certainly not Catholic, thought of it as a somewhat outdated religion. 
but they also knew wealthy Catholic merchants. They certainly traded with Catholics and so forth. So it's definitely a mix. And what the Feliki were picking up on was the fact that the separation of church and state in the United States actually did provide a space in which Catholicism could develop. Whereas since the 1760s, the growing power of European nation states, even Catholic ones such as France, was encroaching on the Catholic Church and demanding to control the Church in ways that the American government really would not have. And this was only intensifying during the French Revolution and Napoleonic eras. So it sounds like early Americans actually had a lot of tolerance for Catholicism. Now, what about the practice of Catholicism in early America? Because when we look at religion throughout the history of early America, we usually see that there was a difference between the way a certain faith was practiced in early America versus how it was practiced in Europe by Europeans. So were there any differences in the way that early Americans practiced Catholicism versus how Europeans practice Catholicism? Oh, absolutely. So this material culture that she loved in Italy did not exist in the United States. Priests in the colonial period are traveling on horseback. They're carrying altar stones and holy oils in saddlebags. And that is the extent of what Catholic material culture is in some places. There also aren't monasteries, right? There aren't convents. And there are simply very few priests. So the Catholicism that developed in Maryland, for example, which is where more Catholic colonists live than anywhere else, was much more based in the household, based on a kind of interior piety, involved reading the Bible, much more than it did participation in public rituals, public festivals, feast days because those things really didn't exist in the colonies, and even in Maryland, often were not allowed to exist. Okay, so to recap our story of Elizabeth Seton a little bit here, we have a 30-year-old Seton who's a widowed, destitute mother of five, who, against the wishes of all her friends and family, converted to Catholicism while in Italy. So Catherine, after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I'd really like for you to tell us what happens next in Seton's story. Wow, Elizabeth Seton certainly experienced many trials. Can you imagine what it must have been like to watch your spouse's business and health falter, to travel to Italy over many weeks and a gambit to improve both, and then to watch your spouse die just before you officially entered your foreign port? I imagine it must have been of some comfort to Seton and her family to have the Flaky family there to greet them when they came ashore. But this raises an interesting question. How did they greet each other? Because for the Flaky and Seton families to communicate, they had to contend with the fact that one family spoke English while the other family spoke Italian. Today, it can be much easier to learn a different language and to communicate with each other because we have apps like Babbel, the number one selling language learning app in the world. Babbel can have you speaking a new language within weeks. And part of that is because of the ease with which you can use Babbel. Babbel's 10 to 15 minute lessons are available anytime, anywhere on your desktop, smartphone, or tablet device. And Babbel syncs your progress across all your devices so you can always pick up right where you left off. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. So if you've ever wanted to learn a new language or improve your skills in a language you studied years ago, go to babbel.com or download the Babbel app and try its lessons for free. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L.com or download the Babbel app and try it for free. Babbel, speak a new language with confidence. Catherine, what happened to Elizabeth Seton after she converted to Catholicism? When did she come back to the United States and what brought her back? She had always planned to return to the United States and she does so after less than a year spent in Italy. And one of the Felici brothers, the younger, more handsome one, Antonio, accompanies her to New York. And the idea there is that the Fleeky expect, and they're correct, that her friends and family and her minister, John Henry Hobart, will try to convince her to change her mind. 
They do. And the fact that Antonio has come back with her make them even more suspicious. They basically feel that a grieving widow has been taken advantage of and they want her to come back to her senses. And she actually does recant her conversion and then spend months and months and months reading and praying and questioning and crying over what the proper faith for her and her children is. And nobody's going to make that decision for her. She makes it for herself. She does decide to convert to Catholicism. And her family's response, they're not pleased. But first of all, they're glad she's made a decision. And secondly, it's what I think of as kind of the Thanksgiving approach. Think what you will, just don't make a scene of it. Let's not have arguments about it. But Seton has the zeal of a new convert, and she wants to convince other people of the superiority of the Catholic faith. She would stop doing this fairly quickly. But at this point, she is proselytizing. She's a flame. And that really is what upsets her family no end. They're financially supporting her. They feel they've respected her choice and have simply asked her to respect theirs and not try to convert them or their children. And she feels she's doing the world a disservice by keeping her faith to herself. So that kind of impulse then convinces her that she can't live in New York. She must leave her home behind. And she very astutely manages to gain the support of priests throughout the country, but particularly in Baltimore. And she's invited to go there and begin a Catholic school. How did Seton gain the support of these different priests? Did part of her conversion involve writing to different Catholics in the United States? Yeah, she comes from a family of letter writers. These are transatlantic merchants who write letters to conduct their business and conduct their friendships. Her father was a great letter writer and correspondent. And so she is not particularly thrilled by the priests who were at the only parish in Manhattan. And she decides, well, this doesn't need to be the entirety of the Catholic Church for me. So she writes to the nation's only bishop, John Carroll. She writes to priests in Boston. Carroll is very suspicious of her. He thinks that she might, in fact, now be a zealous convert, but he wants to wait and see what happens next. So he politely tells her to cool her jets, <laughs> a completely anachronistic way to put it. But others are thrilled, right, at the prospect of this respectable Protestant matron who has chosen their faith above her own faith. And they see her immediately as a benevolent public face of the church in a way that will be useful to the entire institution. So sometime during Seton's correspondence, she decides to move from New York to Baltimore. So could you tell us something about Baltimore in the early 19th century and what this city and Maryland were like for Seton? Yeah, she arrives with her daughters in Baltimore and she's immediately taken to a Catholic sort of seminary and college, very small one that had been established in Baltimore. And you know, much of what she sees in the city is familiar to her, a somewhat smaller version of New York. But there are absolutely more Catholics. Catholics had helped to found the colony and there were prominent Catholic families, the Brents, the Neals, and above all, the Carrolls who took her in and were socially and economically powerful in that city. There are also white refugees from the revolution in Saint-Domingue who were Catholic, and they had brought the people they enslaved with them, many of whom practiced some form of Catholicism as well. So, it was a distinctive environment, but she was again kind of surrounded by wealthy merchants, in this case, far more slaveholders than she had known in New York. So it wasn't entirely unfamiliar. And in fact, she was a little disappointed, I think, at how much it sometimes felt like New York. It didn't feel like a world apart. It didn't always feel like she was on the sacred mission that she wanted for herself. She was, at the end of the day, a school teacher 
being very well supported by wealthy people. Yeah, it sounds like Baltimore was a very familiar environment for Seton, although perhaps Baltimore was a bit more worldly in how it viewed religion, but perhaps not as worldly as a place as she'd become accustomed to in Italy. Yeah, that's true. And also, even though there are more Catholics in Baltimore and there is the St. Mary's Seminary, there are not gorgeous cathedrals, right? There are not convents. There are not monasteries. And there's just a great deal of the hurly-burly of daily life. Even a lot of the members of these Catholic families had very happily married Protestants. And that's something that Elizabeth would, again, later in her life, absolutely accept. But at this sort of white hot moment, not long after her conversion, she really wanted a supercharged version of Catholic life that she was not quite seeing in Baltimore. So what did Seton do about this situation? Because as we heard you mention earlier, Elizabeth Seton was a woman on a mission, on a Catholic mission of sorts. Yeah. What ends up happening is that, again, in collaboration with some clergy, a vexatious collaboration, right? These relationships were difficult, but nonetheless, in collaboration with clergy, she founds a tiny religious community. And it is based on French societies, which did not require cloister. Cloister was not practical in general in the United States. And of course, Elizabeth has five young children (laughs) whom she is still responsible for. Cloister is not a possibility in her life. So the religious community that she founds is modeled mainly on the Daughters of Charity who worked with the poor as they understood it, but also on the Ursulines who ran schools. and. The community is set up in rural Maryland on a plot of land, which also is worked by enslaved people in a kind of unfortunate but important part of the story. And that is also near a Catholic school for boys. So they set off long before anything is ready for them and live in an unfinished house and found this school, and almost Elizabeth clearly feels playhouse for a while, right? She is acting as Mother Seton long before she truly feels that she's in any meaningful sense competent to be the mother of a religious community. What was life like for Seton in this religious community? Because it sounds like she was used to living in cities, and now she had moved to what sounds like pretty rural place where there was definitely a lot of hard work that would be required to develop it and build it into religious community. Yeah, it is beautiful. And it is still beautiful. I have to say that part of Maryland, which is near the Blue Ridge, is just a gorgeous mix of kind of hills and streams and the Blue Ridge in the distance. And she'd always loved nature and she was very moved by that. She was happy to have hardship. Not having hardship unsettled her. Hardship she was okay with. And she attracted to herself a small but committed group of women who wanted to share this life. And, you know, this is a little bit before you have other utopian communities starting in the United States, right? Brook Farm, for example, people deciding we're going to live differently and for a higher purpose. This Religious community was part of the Catholic tradition, but you also had kind of rebellious young women joining it to make a new life and to feel as if they were not simply living out their domestic destinies. She had chronic spiritual crises, especially in the first years that she was there. She often felt that her prayer life was barren. She felt that she was faking it in a way. She got into conflicts with the priests that were supposed to direct her, and she could not set aside her judgment, but she could not also simply embrace disobedience. So it was an extraordinarily difficult period of her life and made more difficult because she knew she had fractured these relationships with her family. She'd uprooted her children. 
all in order to found this community. And now here she was. And it really sometimes felt as if it was not authentic. So what did Seton do to bring some authenticity back into her life? Did she stay in Emmitsburg or did she opt to move again? She stayed in Emmitsburg. In fact, she took one trip to Baltimore when a relative was dying, but basically stayed there the rest of her life. And she always acted in a way that suggested she was in control. She also took great solace as the months and then years went on in the rhythms of community life so that this Catholic community was ordered by the ringing of bells, right? By the saying of prayers at certain times, by seasons of work, by seasons within the church. And she found that meaningful and helpful. And, you know, I think originally she had sort of thought, well, we're good people, we'll make a good community. And after a while, she thought more, well, this good community can help make us good people. But her kind of struggle ended only, I would say, in the last few years of her life. Then you really do get the sense of an extremely deep serenity. Before then, there's always struggle. At the start of our conversation, when we asked you for an overview of Elizabeth Seton's life, you noted that Seton founded a religious order called the Sisters of Charity. And you also said that the sisters did a lot of good works. So would you tell us something about Seton's religious order and the good works that the Sisters of Charity performed? Sure. This is, in the again, in the tradition of the French Daughters of Charity. Even in Emmitsburg, the plan always was to accept local girls who could not pay tuition. And the school did do that. As Elizabeth ruefully noted, they were in a very rural area, and it's not as if one was in 17th century Paris and could go and find all kinds of people that needed help. So Emmitsburg did not offer that kind of mission initially, but other cities did, such as Philadelphia, which was beginning, this is in the 18-teens, to see more Catholic orphans or young Catholic children whose parents couldn't care for them, whether they were alive or dead, being deposited into the care of priests there. And so a delegation was sent out from Emmitsburg, actually led by a woman, Sister Rose, who had been kind of problematic in Emmitsburg because like Elizabeth, she was a very strong personality and they had these clashes. But in Philadelphia, she was the mistress of that domain and she immediately established an orphanage, does seem to have cared for the children well by the standards of the time, attracted benefactors. And then before too long, they also established an orphanage in New York City. And from there, through the 19th century, they established more and more kind of schools and orphanages. Earlier, you noted that Seton struggled throughout her life, but that her life and work in Emmitsburg with the Sisters of Charity eventually brought her a sense of serenity. Now, Seton didn't live a long life. She died at the age of 46 in 1821. So could you tell us more about the end of Seton's life and the peace she found? How she died physically is almost surely as the result of tuberculosis. She had been around tuberculosis really since her marriage. And we now know that some people are more genetically susceptible to tuberculosis. And it's absolutely clear that her husband's family had this genetic susceptibility. And she lost two of her three daughters to tuberculosis as well. Elizabeth probably was not highly susceptible to consumption, as they called it, but she lived surrounded by it for decades. And it does seem finally to have killed her. Before that period, she had come to inhabit this role as Mother Seton. She had set aside this sort of proselytizing zeal that characterized her right after her conversion and had very explicitly decided that it was not hers to try to convince other people how to believe. What she would do was to live in a relationship with God that allowed her to live in a compassionate, loving, quite humble relationship with other people. 
And she believed that Catholic doctrine helped her to do that. She wasn't going to try to convince others of that. She'd live in such a way that she hoped others might be interested in knowing the source of her peace and her love. She wrote at one point that fear nothing so much as not to love enough. So it boiled down into something much simpler than she'd known earlier. And in the last months of her life, there really was kind of a constant stream of sisters and priests just wanting to be in her presence. Again, in a way, she always had a sense of humor that struck her as a little over the top, (laughs) struck her as maybe somewhat inappropriate given her sense of her own frailty and kind of her general sense of the ridiculousness of all people. But she accepted that she had become an important figure in this tiny world that was American Catholicism. And speaking of American Catholicism, in 1975, the Catholic Church canonized Elizabeth Seton as the first American saint. Catherine, do you know what was behind the decision to canonize Seton? There were various efforts in the United States to promote what are called causes, right? The sort of campaigns for people to become saints. And in fact, Mother Cabrini, who was an immigrant, had been made a saint. Interestingly, in the 20th century, particularly as the demography of American Catholicism changed because of immigration restrictions placed earlier in the century, there was a desire to have a native-born American saint. So it was very much a function, not simply of faith, but of nationalism, right? And a certain kind of politics, respectability politics, really, is how I think of it. And a lot of women already looked to Elizabeth Seton as a kind of model. She was a single mother, right? She was a widow. She had to work when she had children. There are all kinds of things about her that appealed and really still appeal to people. She'd known the death of her husband, of her children. So actually in the file that was sent to Rome, which you can see actually now in Emmitsburg, there are all these petitions signed by American women. And they look like petitions that might have been in an earlier time, abolitionist petitions, right? Or prohibition petitions. But they're petitions that the Pope make Elizabeth Seton, this American wife and mother, a saint. And the clear idea there is that she would not be threatening to non-Catholics and she would provide a model for American Catholics and particularly American Catholic women to emulate. So now that we've reached the point in the story where we have St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, would you tell us why you think she makes a good window for us to look through? What her life reveals to us about the early American past? One thing I love about her is she was the woman who changed her mind. She felt strongly, but she changed her mind. And because of that, and because of the way her papers have been preserved, we can see her thinking about all kinds of things, whether they are political questions, whether they are spiritual questions, whether they are very personal questions, such as whether she wants to remarry after the death of her husband in a way that is just so unusual. We rarely get to see inside anyone's mind like that, let alone the mind of an early American woman. And she also did move through these various milieus. So she's in this kind of free thinking or open thinking philosophical inquiry as a young person. She's interested in a particular flavor of Episcopalianism. She is exposed to a lot of people who have fled the French Revolution and their different model of Catholicism. She lives in two port cities. She lives in a sort of remote countryside. So she travels through an array of historical possibilities and she turns them over in her mind in a way that we can see on paper. Now let's move into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently.
opinion, what might have happened if Seton had never visited Italy? Do you think she would have converted to Catholicism? I do not think she would have converted to Catholicism because she was won over really by Italian Catholicism, by this whole world of beauty and ritual and history, which New York's lone parish simply did not offer. So this is a scholar's answer, right? A person of faith, you know, might say, well, she would have had to convert at some point because we need Elizabeth Seton. So from my point of view, she would not have converted. And her husband absolutely would have died. He was doomed by tuberculosis. And she had made a number of mordant remarks about her reluctance to remarry, not because she had not had a happy marriage, she had, but I think because she'd seen all of the tribulations marriage could offer and she was very strong-minded. But there would have been a lot of pressure for her to marry and kind of restart her life as a matron. She was only 30. She might very well have had a whole other set of children, probably participated in Protestant benevolent organizations, as she actually did before her conversion. She would have continued to do that. It's difficult to see anything other than, and I know this is in some sense counterintuitive, but anything other than the Catholic Church that would have offered the kind of vehicle for her to become known as a spiritual athlete and as the founder of institutions in the way that she did. So she probably would have been another fabulously interesting woman that we don't really know anything about if she had not gone to Italy. So Catherine, what are you researching and writing about now? Is there another cultural or religious aspect of history that you're working on? So at the moment, I have turned to Jesuits in the colonial period for a kind of collaborative project. The Jesuits really are a great example of people that are part of the history of religion, part of the history of imperialism, part of the history of the United States, of Europe, right? They stand at the intersection of all of these ways of thinking about history that absolutely should be combined. So lately, I've been reading a lot more than writing about the Jesuits' activities and adventures and misadventures throughout the colonies. How can we get in contact with you if we have more questions about Elizabeth Seton or Catholicism in early America? I love questions about Elizabeth Seton and Catholicism in early America. So I can be found very readily through the ASU website. That's probably the easiest way to do it. I'm actually on Twitter, kind of incompetently, but I'm on Twitter. So I can be found there. But I hope that anyone would find me through the ASU website and go ahead and send me an email if they're interested. Catherine O'Donnell, thank you for introducing us to Elizabeth Seton and for telling us something about Catholicism in early America. Thank you. I very much enjoyed it. Elizabeth Ann Seton was a saint, but she was also a wife, mother and woman who lived during the early years of the early American Republic. Now, thanks to the encouragement of a priest who collaborated with Seton, and thanks to the process of Catholic sainthood, we have a lot of records about Seton's life. And these records reveal a great deal about life in the early American Republic. So we know that Seton watched as her father, a loyalist, struggle to reestablish himself in New York society after the revolution. We know that she experienced the rise and fall of her husband's business fortunes. And we know that she enjoyed reading books and tracts by French philosophes. We also know that Seton was a woman who experienced and knew loss. Both her husband and several of her children died of tuberculosis. So Elizabeth Seton's life and work really allows us to see a great deal about the personal side of everyday life in the early United States. Plus, through Seton's journals, diaries, and papers, we can better understand what it was like to seek out, experiment with, and find faith in early America. Now, Seton converted to Catholicism not long after the death of her husband. As Catherine related, Seton just fell in love with the experience and aesthetics of Italian Catholicism. She loved the giant churches and cathedrals, the beautiful religious artwork, and how the people of Italy just seemed to pay close attention in church. Seton also seems to have been moved by the way that Catholicism connected heaven and earth, through its religious imagery, its gestures such as the signing of the cross, and its culture of the saints. It was all of these aspects of Catholicism that helped Seton feel more connected to the divine 
in a way that she just didn't feel connected in her Protestant life. Now, as Catherine pointed out, Seton wanted to feel this connection continuously. When Seton returned to the United States, she tried to find and live a life that allowed her to pay close attention in church and to do acts and perform rituals that helped her live a moral life. Elizabeth Seton's life is one that shows us what it was like to live and worship as a Catholic in the early Republic. It's also a life that shows us what it was like to live as a woman and an outspoken woman at that in the early United States. Seton was a woman who felt and thought strongly. She was a woman who tried to do right by her children, her family, her followers, and her faith. And to do right sometimes meant changing her mind, which at times put her at odds with the ideas of friends, family, and priests. Now, to study and explore the life of Elizabeth Ann Seton is to explore and study the life of a woman who tried to live a faithful life. But it's also an opportunity to really explore and study a personal example of what it was like to live in the early United States. Look for more information about Catherine, her book, Elizabeth Seton, A Life, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 257. Don't forget, we're meeting up in Atlanta, Georgia on Saturday, October 12th. For more details about this meetup and our RSVP, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash meetup. Speak a new language with confidence. Try Babbel's 10 to 15 minute language learning lessons for yourself by visiting babbel.com or by downloading the Babbel app and trying it for free. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com or download the Babbel app and try it for free. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's Digital Projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, I know questions of religion and faith in early America fascinate you. So what more would you like to know about it? Tell me, Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.